make a little start. I don't know why everyone's all, everyone's all over this side tonight, so they are. This, I think this side's got blown away, so they have their... There's, there's a couple not too well, I know, um, this evening, uh, so that's uh, part of the reason, but it is certainly a, a windy night, uh, definitely, isn't it? Um, Alfie and I were standing there this morning, and I don't know about people coming in, but um, it seemed like half the leaves were coming into the church to join us. We were now getting blown away in the door. So um, it's good to see us all uh, gathered out uh, this evening. I'm glad you all made the, the journey to, to come here. Um, just, I'm not going to go over all the announcements this morning. just want to draw your attention to one of them, and that's the, the Seafarers Christian Friends Society. We talked about that uh, the little Christmas collection for them. But as we mentioned, we do need that in by, really by the end of, of November, uh, those little packs. And, but, but we'll give you more information about the exact sort of uh, date for that and so on as well. But um, you can take one of the little letters sitting at the table down that side. And uh, just for more information on that, and Hazel, we'll be collecting those in if any queries on it, uh, mention it to Hazel. But uh, uh, we're going to begin tonight by singing a hymn which reminds us of really the greatness of God's love for us, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. And of course, that love was displayed in God giving, God the Father giving us his Son on the cross. And we'll stand as we sing it together, please.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks for your great love. And Father, there is a sense that we can never fully fathom that love, even at what a cost, the fact that you were willing to send of your Son and that he would give of himself. Father, we can read the descriptions of what Jesus even endured for us. But yet, Father, just it's, it's hard to comprehend even just all that he went through, Lord, for us. To truly understand the, the great depths of his suffering. To truly know, Lord, even how, that, how you felt, Lord, even in seeing that moment. But, Father, he did that for the greater joy set before him. The greater joy, Lord, even in knowing that, that many sons would be brought to glory. Lord, we want to thank you for that. We give thanks for his perfect obedience. And Father, help us even as we proclaim of Jesus once again tonight, as we meet with you and your word once more, as we see of how Jesus even uh, addresses even others and challenges others whose even hearts were hardened towards you. Father, may that word even just speak to us tonight. May it fill us with wonder, Lord, at the fact that Jesus gave this invitation. And Father, the invitation is still open today to all who will come to you, to all who will trust in you. Once again, we do pray, Lord, even for um, even other churches where that message is being proclaimed tonight, the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. We do pray that people would set their hope in you alone. And Father, we pray, Lord, as the word goes forth and it's power, your, your power, Lord, that it will accomplish that, that purpose. And Father, for, for those even watching online tonight, maybe if there's someone who doesn't know you as well, we pray that, Lord, their hearts would be receptive even to your word. May our hearts be receptive to that word as well and help us to respond to it even this evening as well. Help us as we sing these hymns, Lord, as we direct our hearts and our attentions even to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing a hymn which is based on the words, of course, of Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd, I not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. We'll stay seated as we sing this.
We're returning once again to Matthew's Gospel. We're looking at Matthew 22 this evening. And when we were last in our series in this Matthew's Gospel, we saw Jesus being challenged by the, the scribes and the chief priests. They were, they were wanting to know by whose authority was he doing these things, casting people out of the temple? What authority did he have to heal the sick? And really they were coming trying to trap him. But actually the reverse happened and Jesus turned the tables on them. He asked that uh, he, if it, you know, he would answer them if, if they would tell him by what authority John had operated. And if they said, well, well, John the Baptist had God's authority, then that would have meant that these chief priests and scribes were agreeing with all that John said. But of course, what did John declare about Jesus? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So they couldn't say that. They didn't want to say that. Sure, they didn't. Uh, or if they said that John's authority was only human, then that was also going to lose them favor with many who recognized him as being a prophet. Many whose lives were changed by John's ministry. And so really they were caught and they, they couldn't say anything. And so Jesus told them two parables which confronted them over their sin. And that was what we looked at last week. The first parable was about two sons. And Jesus was showing them that actually all who repent and believe can enter God's kingdom. And the implication is, you know, you can do this too if you believe. And then the final parable then we looked at last week it was of these rebellious tenants. Who, and he warned them about the consequences really through this parable of rejecting God's chosen one. And each time Jesus is really setting before them an invitation. But the question is, will they accept it? But as we're going to see tonight, there's another invitation coming. And we're going to read that as he tells his final set in the, these parables which he tells to these chief priests and scribes. Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. And Jesus, again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready. But those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And we know that God will bless the reading of his word together. You know, the chief priests were those who rejected. They, they rejected even those previous invitations. And now another one, another invitation has been given. You know, but to those of us here believers, the name of Jesus is one that is precious. You know, we can think of the many different titles for Jesus. He's one who is our redeemer. He's one who is our, the good shepherd. And so we can say tonight, and we can truly sing the words of this next hymn, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds and a believer's ear. We'll stand as we sing this together, please. Thank you. 
Let's turn to Matthew 22 again. This is a story of a wedding. We love getting an invitation to a wedding, don't we? Weddings are often, uh, today, great, great lavish affairs, kind of gone in the days, it seems, of, of simple weddings. And actually, a survey was taken of 4,000 newlyweds, and they discovered that the average wedding cost today was now 24,000. Well, it ranged between 20,000 and 24,000. I know it's eye-watering, isn't it? But, you know, weddings are special occasions, but some people go to extreme extravagance though for weddings and maybe if they're going to 24,000 they probably are actually but you know the there's uh, weddings are often great extravagant occasions there's different things you need to think about the food what food are you going to have you know uh, a McDonald's happy saver meal can't quite cut it um and, the, and then there's you know what are you going to do to decorate the place what are you going to do and what are you going to put out what decorations shall we have and then there's not just decorations for the church there's, there's decorations for the, the tables then as well and, and then it, it, it all just adds up you know but they're, they're, they're la- great, often great lavish affairs but here's the thing often the brides and grooms they want everything though, to be perfect don't they they want everything to be absolutely perfect you know, there's a list of so many things, uh, whether it be the outfits, the, the venue, the food. But sometimes weddings don't always go according to plan, do they? Little did I think in, in uh, January 2020 when I proposed to Emma that we'd be in the middle of a pandemic when our wedding was happening. But uh, we were just thankful that the wedding did happen. But sometimes weddings don't always go according to plan. And that was, I suppose, our hiccup. Thankfully, everything else went okay on the day but here jesus tells a story about uh, a wedding banquet and it is a lavish one it's a lavish one and actually things don't quite go the way well the, the it's the king hosting this banquet things don't quite go the way he expects as well but jesus is using this story of of a great lavish wedding to, to illustrate something much greater to illustrate something much more wonderful He's using it to talk about the kingdom of God. And that's much better than any, any wedding banquet. It's much more, more lavish than anything even we can fully even comprehend. Uh, what does it say? I, I has not seen nor ear heard what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. You know, Jesus told this parable, uh, not just to the religious leaders, the chief priests and scribes, but, but bear in mind there was others actually gathered around because Jesus was teaching this when he was in the temple. He came to the temple to, to teach and to, uh, to share the gospel as well. And he began to, to teach uh, while his uh, chief priests and scribes had sought to criticize him and to trap him. Jesus used this as an opportunity to, to issue another invitation. And he actually teaches about an invitation to a wedding to use to illustrate that. He likens the kingdom of heaven to a king who gives a, a wedding feast for his son. And sometimes as we go through these uh, parables, sometimes we go through the parable first and then come back to the meaning. Well, I'm going to kind of go through the meaning just as we go through this one tonight. Uh, So I'll pause at various points and consider what is Jesus communicating to us about this and and how does it relate to the kingdom of heaven? You know, any royal wedding, when you think of it, is normally a wonderful occasion. When we think of what goes into planning a wedding, you know, um, it, it multiply that by about 10, 20, maybe even 100 times when it comes to organizing a royal wedding, I'm sure. There's often great anticipation, isn't there, beforehand? And sometimes it can be a great occasion for the whole nation. And it'll be shown live on TV often. People uh, attend street parties even as well. But in ancient times, here's the way it would have worked for royal weddings. If there was a royal wedding like, an, like this in an ancient time, it would have been a countrywide celebration. So the celebrations wouldn't just have lasted for one day. They would have went on for several days. And like our weddings, an invitation would be sent out, um, usually to notify the people of when it was happening. So an invitation would be sent out. But then another invitation would happen as well to notify them on the day when the feast was ready. Now you might add, you might ask yourself, sorry, why, why was that? Why did they need the second invitation? Well, nowadays, when someone gives you a wedding invitation, they'll tell you it's maybe on Saturday, the the such and such of November, and it's at 12 p.m., right? You'll get that. That's your invitation. 
In those days, they couldn't exactly look at their watches and go, oh, there it is, it's time now, we need to be, we need to be there. So what they had to do was the king would send out his servants and basically say, you know, they knew what day it was going to be on, but they would send out the servants whenever the meal was ready. So whenever the meal was ready, whenever it was time to gather, and people would come in. And yet what we see is, it doesn't quite go the way the king expects. Look at verse 3. Because when the king sends invitations, sends his servants out to tell them that the feast is ready, so an invitation had already been sent, the people would have known this royal wedding's happening. And then he says, come out, you know, the time's ready. And yet the people don't come. I wonder if you were invited to a lavish feast. I think if I was invited to a lavish feast, I don't think I'd be delaying quite, quite the way some of these people are. But word gets back to the king. And he decides then instead to send other servants. And he tells his servants, look, urge them to come in this time. Maybe tell them something about their, their missing out on. Because notice what he tells them. He says, tell them the dinner's ready. Tell them the oxen and the fatted calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. So everything's ready. He's emphasized the amount of food. So in other words, people aren't going to be saying, oh, there might not be enough left for us. No, there's more than enough for everyone. Um, it's lavish and again they pay no attention one goes off to his farm the other does business but we don't quite fully grasp i think the the full impact of how this would be because imagine us receiving an invitation from the king imagine we were invited to say a garden party in buckingham palace and you maybe fly over to london you know all expenses paid but then on the day you say to yourself, oh, do you know what? It's a nice day. I fancy a wee coffee. Do you think we'll go out instead? Maybe, maybe let's go out for a coffee. Or um, maybe we'll go, have you seen Madame Tussauds? I haven't seen it for a while, so we'll go there instead. How would that be viewed by the king? Do you think the king would be, well, to be honest, King Charles might not be worried, to be honest, if one or two people didn't come. But if you were a king in ancient times and the people were all refusing to come to your son's wedding, this was a major insult, a major insult. And actually, not only would it just be rude, it was actually a real slight to the king's authority. Basically, they were saying to the king, look, I don't care really about your, your royal wedding. I've got enough to go on with my own house. But this is a mild reaction, actually, the way than what others do. Because notice how others respond. Others actually take these servants. Verse 6 they seize the servants. They treat them shamefully. They even kill them. Now, if that's not even a clear statement of rebellion, I don't know what is. Now, let's pause here for a moment. How is this like the kingdom of heaven? Well, firstly, it teaches us that, you know, the kingdom of heaven, this, it reminds us that this invitation is graciously given. You see, it's easy to see who some of the people might be in this parable. Um, the king, of course, we can see who that represents. That represents God the Father. The Son, it's not too hard to guess who that represents. That represents Jesus. And in fact, often in Scripture, Christ is likened to a bridegroom. For example, in Matthew 25, Jesus himself is going to tell a later parable. It'll make that even clearer. And this banquet spoken of, really, um, he's referring even in what, uh, it, it reminds us of what's known in Scripture as the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Bible tells us there will be a time when the church will be presented to Christ as a bride, something that's spoken of in Revelation. You know, that's something which is future anticipation. We're looking forward to that day. But this isn't just all about the future. This is about them responding in the present. Salvation is not just a future experience. It's also a present reality too. And so Jesus is saying to them, look, an invitation is being graciously given here. And you have a choice to do about this, what you do about this here and now. He's, he's you communicating this to them. Um, you know, this, this banquet that Jesus has prepared, this, this messianic banquet we're talking about, and, and Isaiah 25, um, it's not just spoken of in the New Testament, by the way. Um, Isaiah 25 also alludes to this one day death will be swallowed up and a rich banquet will be provided for his people. Isaiah 25 verses 6 to 9. So the image of this being like a wedding is also pictured in Isaiah. The day of a glorious day. A day when, when death will be swallowed up. And you know a wedding is a joyous occasion. 
It's a joyous occasion. Not only are you delighting that the, the bride and groom has got married, but everyone is enjoying even the, the food provided. And, you know, Jesus is inviting them to, to enter into this experience of great joy, something that God has prepared for those who trust in him. He's inviting them to accept his invitation. And Isaiah 62 as well. As I say, this isn't just something that comes later in the New Testament. They would have known um, images like this as well. Isaiah 62 pictures God delighting in his people, likening to, as a bride adorned for his husband. So this invitation was issued to, to God's people, the Jewish people. There's an invitation here. Respond and you can enter into God's kingdom. Well, who are the, the servants here Um, The servants were sent out with these invitations. Well, like the parable of the tenants, these are people like the prophets and the apostles even who would come after them. God had invited his people into a relationship with them. Right back to the time he'd made the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he had sent servants to the people. He'd sent people like Moses to them as well. He'd sent Elijah. He'd sent Isaiah. He'd sent Jeremiah urging his people to turn to him, to trust in him, to truly trust in him, and also to trust in the one he would send, the one he had uh, spoken of as well, the Messiah he would send. And yet so often Israel had mistreated God's servants. They had rejected the prophets often, hadn't they? Even during the time of Elijah. We talked about this last week. Um, how uh, Jezebel had actually uh, demanded that the prophets would even be, be killed as well. You know, God graciously, though, invites people to come and enter into his kingdom, to enter his presence. And that's why he sent Jesus to come to earth, wasn't it? He was inviting them even through the invitation. He was going to open up the new and living way and his life, his death, and his resurrection. This way was going to be opened. And God was inviting people to respond to believe and come to him. And Jesus was speaking to a group of Jewish people and he's reminding them, you've been given an invitation. And actually, every time Jesus was addressing them and Jesus was sharing of the kingdom of God, that invitation was going out again and again. They had a choice as to how they respond. You know, it's like an invitation for a wedding. Really, there's only two responses. For a wedding, you either accept or you reject the invitation. There's no such thing as just being indifferent to the invitation. You know, because if you don't respond in a positive way, well, you have rejected the invitation. You're you're not going. And so Jesus is inviting these people, these hearers, to to come to what God has provided, to, to enter in. And they must enter in in the way God has provided as well. We'll see that a little bit later as well. He's describing it as a wedding feast because, you know, the place that God has prepared for us is a wonderful place. Much more joyous even than any, any lavish wedding uh, celebration. You know, it's a place where there is no sickness and death. A place where there is peace. A place where there is true joy. A place that, it, that is perfect. You know, few people can say that about things in this life. That they're perfect. You know, even um, in any wedding that happens, something always happens in a wedding where it doesn't happen maybe the way you expect it to. But you know, this is one wedding feast. This is one place that's prepared for us and it is completely perfect. It's eternal and unfading. And so in Jesus giving them this parable, the third parable now he's given these people and he's giving them this invitation to respond. So Jesus graciously wants people to enter his kingdom and to have fellowship with him. But this parable also teaches us something else. And that is, many respond to God's invitation in various ways. When Jesus said these words, his people had been invited into that kingdom. Many had welcomed that invitation. And yet now that God's son, his Messiah, the king's son, had entered into our world, the invitation was being offered to believe in him. And yet listen to what it says at the beginning of John's gospel, how many responded. John 1, verse 11 to 12 says, Jesus came to his own and his own people didn't receive him. Many of his own people didn't receive him. But yet it says, to all who did receive him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You know, sadly, some of the people just responded with, in the parable, with difference 
uh, with indifference and disinterest. Because once they received that invitation, they just very simply went off to their daily lives. They went off to their businesses or whatever. And isn't that how some people respond to the invitation of the gospel? It seems like when you share the message of the gospel with someone, with some it seems like it makes no impact at all on them. They just say, well, that's okay for you, but not for me. Or, or maybe it's because they have more interest in the likes of the material things than the spiritual. Little, little realizing that one day they are going to have to give an account for what they did and how they responded to that message. Or else you can also meet people who say, you know, well, I've no time to respond to it now, but, but maybe when I'm older. Or maybe when I'm on my deathbed or something like that. But yet none of us knows what tomorrow brings. Sure, we don't. No, none of us know. Little do they realize it's a serious thing to reject God's invitation. There's no sitting in the fence. By not accepting, we are rejecting. And it has eternal consequences. And then there's others who respond more aggressively. Maybe not to the extent of we see here in the parable, mind you. But, you know, there are some who, who get offended if you, you talk about sin. They say, who are you to call me a, a sinner? Well, it's not me calling you a sinner. It's actually the word of God. It's God telling us that we're all sinners. That's what the Bible says. None of us are righteous. No, not one. You get often people saying, surely I'm not that bad, am I? And this is how Satan wants to often blind people, isn't it? To keep them in the dark about their spiritual state before him. But yet when you think about it, this king in the parable shows himself as gracious. Not just gracious, but long-suffering. Think of how many invitations went out. There would have been one initially to invite people along to, to this feast. There was an invitation on the day whenever the feast was ready. And then when the people rejected, there was another invitation. It reminds us of something else. It reminds us that our God is one who is long-suffering and patient. He does give many people opportunities often to hear. Whether that maybe be when they were a child and they heard something at Sunday school of the gospel. Or maybe by bringing a, another Christian into their life. Uh, maybe a, a friend, a family member, or a neighbor even as well. Sometimes God uses various ways to speak to people. And yet isn't it sad when people keep rejecting? Yet our God is long-suffering. But they shouldn't presume in that, you know, that, that that grace will go on forever. Because there will be a moment where the Lord could just as easily say to him, Today, your soul is required of you. God's patience and God's grace does have a limit. And we see that, but what happens next to those who reject the invitation? You see, there are consequences, this teaches us, to rejecting God's invitation. Let's go back to the parable again, and we'll see what that is in verse 7. As the king hears how the people have responded, it's not just they've ignored, but they've shown willful rebellion against him. They've even gone so far as to kill his very servants. And so the king pours out his wrath upon them. Look at verse 7. He sends his troops and he destroys these murderers. And not just that, but he burns their city. Now that's quite a telling thing. As you read that, you say to yourself, that's really an extreme reaction. Not just to, I mean, to kill the people. Well, you can understand if they kill his servants, they're, they're killing the people. But to destroy the whole city. This was normally the sort of thing that would happen if someone was found guilty of serious treason. If a number of people were found guilty of serious treason and revolt against their king. And this is exactly what these Jewish leaders, the chief priests and scribes, were guilty of. They were rejecting God's invitation. And so God was going to judge them for it. And what's interesting about this is, if you know your ancient history as well too, this actually might reflect what happened in Jerusalem. Because in 70 AD, the city was going to be taken by Titus, the son of Emperor, Emperor Vespasian, and the temple was going to be destroyed. Jerusalem was going to literally be torn down. The city was going to be burnt. And about that time, it said that actually more than a million Jews were gathered together in the city. You know, Jesus was warning his hearers. He was warning there's consequences of rejecting. And there's consequences of rejecting God's invitation of salvation. We we'll quoted from Romans 1 this morning. Let me go back there again. Romans 1 reminds us, The wrath of God is revealed against heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth 
in righteousness, on their own righteousness. Because what has been known of God has been made manifest to them. Everyone has been given some measure of revelation. No one can say that they didn't know anything. We talked this morning how even God's creation even bears witness of his existence. But many people, you think of the opportunities that others have had and yet still reject it. Their hearts are dark and their hearts are still hardened. And so Paul, what he says in Romans 1, he calls people like this a fool. You're a fool if you ignore the evidence for God. And the consequences are serious. And this is why Jesus is telling this parable. He wants these people to be totally wide eyed out and realize, actually, here's what's going to happen if you reject. There's serious consequences for rejecting. Not just when you're missing out on a blessing, but there's judgment to come. And we'll come back to that later. See, while some reject the king's invitation, what happens next is quite telling. Because this invitation is offered to all. Look at verse 8. He tells the rest of his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who, were, um, those who previously weren't invited, well, sorry, those who were previously invited weren't worthy. So now what I want you to do is to go into the main roads. Go into the main roads of the city and invite everyone. So there'd been some people were invited before, but now the invitation is just a blanket invitation. Everyone can come. And so they did. They gathered in all they found. And notice what it says, both good and bad. Now, when it says good and bad, um, when it says bad, it's not talking about those who are wicked in God's eyes. Because, of course, the only way to enter this kingdom is by repenting of your sins. But rather, the bad here is talking of those who the Jews viewed as bad. And who did the Jews in ancient times view as bad? It was the Gentiles. They looked at the Gentiles and they likened them, to be honest, to be no more than dogs, even like common dogs. That's how they viewed um, often Gentiles. And the, the bad in their eyes would have been people like, think back to the previous parable we had mentioned about how uh, Jesus uh, talked about how tax collectors believed in him. Those who were prostitutes believed in him as well. And so the invitation is open to all. Even those who the Jews thought, imagine those people being invited. Imagine a Gentile being invited to the kingdom of God. Imagine a, someone who's a tax collector, someone who's corrupt. Imagine someone who's living such an immoral life as, uh, and living in prostitution. Imagine, imagine that. And yet these people are being invited into this kingdom as well. The invitation is open to all good and bad, to all who will come. Again, it's not too hard to see who is spoken of as well. Because while the religious Jews, like these chief priests and scribes, are going to reject, the gospel later is going to go forth to the Gentiles. And they will believe. It's going to go forth to people just like tax collectors, just like Zacchaeus. People who've lived a wild, immoral lifestyle, but yet can see Jesus as the true Savior. They are going to accept that invitation and believe. See, the king's plan wasn't going to be thwarted by a few people who would reject. This wedding feast was going to happen. And so the same is true for this marriage supper, the lamb. God's invitation is not just for, uh, for those who people deem as, as good. It's not just for the rich. It's not just for the respectable. It's for the whosoever will, will come. And there's nothing that we can ever do to earn that invitation into God's kingdom. It reminds us, as Paul reminds us, salvation by grace alone, by God's grace alone. But here's the surprise ending in this story. So there's a surprise in that the people invited didn't come. But in verse 11 to 14, as Jesus tells the parable, he pictures the scene. Everyone's in the banqueting hall. But as the king looks around at the guests gathered before him, and you can imagine the king, you know, as you look around at the full banqueting hall, you know, you look around with a smile on your face. There's, there's the people seated at the tables. There finally is the, the, the reading of the feast. Isn't that wonderful? As he looks around, I'm sure there's a smile on his face. But, but something happens which takes a smile off his face. Someone's not dressed properly. They're not wearing a wedding garment. Now, you might wonder, and many people have wondered this. Surely if this man was just pulled off the street, why would he, the king would have expected him to, to have a wedding garment? Well, here's the thing. In ancient times, and under uh, some circumstances as well, the king would actually provide garments even for the guests as well. 
There is some evidence for that as well too. That the king could have provided appropriate wedding garments. And I think that's even more evident because he's surprised at this man that he isn't wearing it. Everyone else, it seems, is properly attired as well. And as I say, if they've pulled them off the streets, they wouldn't have had the the proper garments, but yet they're all clothed in these wedding garments apart from one. And when he asks this man the question, he's surprised. He says, friend, he speaks to him initially warmly. How did you get in here without a wedding garment? And yet the man can offer no excuse. And as a result, the king commands he be bound hand and foot and thrown out into outer darkness. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now what does that tell us? The last thing that this tells us is there are conditions for entry to God's kingdom. And in order to enter God's kingdom, we need to be clothed properly. And I'm not talking here about physical clothing. I'm not talking about that. In order to enter this kingdom, we need to be clothed in righteousness. But here's the thing, none of us can ever be righteous or good enough in and of ourselves. None of us can be perfect to enter into the presence of a holy God. Yet what we lack, God supplied in Christ. Romans 3 reminds us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it goes on to tell us we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Who God put forward to be a propitiation Now, what's that word mean? That that means an offering that turns away, a sacrifice or an offering that turns away wrath. God put forward Christ as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Jesus offered himself for our sins and through faith in his atoning sacrifice, we are clothed in his righteousness. Our sins were laid upon him and through faith in him, we receive his righteousness in return. It's what's called the divine exchange. Our sins were laid upon him. He was punished. He became our saving substitute. And through faith in him, we receive his righteousness. Revelation 7 speaks of saints having washed their robes and made them white through the blood of the Lamb. Christ's blood brings cleansing for sinners. And this is the only way that people are going to be able to stand before God in the day of judgment. Not if they're clothed in their own righteousness. Because that's not going to be good enough. We need to be clothed in Christ's righteousness. His perfect righteousness. And there's a warning here for these people. For those who have rejected Christ, you'll be cast out. The outer darkness speaking of eternal punishment, which awaits those who reject Christ. Rather than an eternity in heaven, a place where there is peace, where there is joy. Here is a place where there is condemnation, a place of torment, a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now Jesus is telling these parables not because he delights in judgment, but he's telling them precisely because he doesn't want people to go to that outer darkness. He wants people to repent and believe. That's why the king sent the servants again and again, because the king wants people to come in. God wants people. That's why he he shares the gospel with them through many different means. And so Jesus concludes by saying, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called because this gospel is going out far and wide. You think about it even nowadays in terms of even the internet. Uh, Those days of even um, when the pandemic happened, the gospel even as a result of it went even so much further even as well into other places because of even services that weren't online previously, then went online. Many people can now hear the gospel. They can have access to this. Many will hear the message, but yet not all will respond. In fact, only a few will. And it is sobering, isn't it? To be reminded of what awaits those who reject. It reminds us we have a great responsibility too, don't we? To share of that gospel message. Because we don't want people to go to that outer darkness, to be, to be separated from God. We want the, those people, those maybe friends and loved ones, we want them to be with us in heaven. We want them to be with us. We don't want to see them lost. And you know, as believers, it's, it is good for us to remember what awaits us, but it does remind us if there is a great responsibility we have to share this message. And once we've shared it, be faithful in praying and to not give up praying 
Do you know, it's hard, isn't it, sometimes maybe when you have shared the message with someone and as yet still they have not yet repented. You know, you've maybe tried different things. You've tried different ways. You've invited them along to the to, to evenings or events in the church and still they've not yet come. You know, don't give up. Don't lose heart. You know, the Lord is one who is long-suffering. And we pray that for those who we do share that message with, that, that they will not miss that opportunity. Because there will be a time when, when either Christ will return or there'll be a time when God's grace and that patience will be at an end and their soul will be required of them. But yet we, be, we pray that they will respond to that message. And if you're listening to this message tonight and you're not a Christian, the invitation is being given. Jesus is giving this invitation here. The people he was speaking to, this was, well, uh, this was so many. He'd already given them three invitations in these parables to enter into this kingdom. The entry is only by repenting, by returning from our sins and turning to God and trusting in Jesus as our Savior. He's made the way clear. And you know, many are still invited today to God's kingdom to trust in the one who he has sent. And God's issued a wonderful invitation. It is a gracious invitation because none of us deserve it. You know, maybe if you're watching this tonight and you're not a Christian, maybe you've had, think back to the opportunities you've heard the gospel in your life. Maybe as a child. Maybe through your mother or father's faith, how they've talked to you. Maybe through that gospel tract you've been given and just put it in your pocket somewhere. Or maybe from something you've seen as well something you've watched on TV, a a, a film or something that's really struck you. But as you listen to this tonight, God's giving you another opportunity to respond. And there's only two ways we respond to this invitation. You either accept it or you reject it. There's no sitting in the fence because by not accepting, it is rejecting. Jesus is calling tonight. I wonder, will you trust in him? Let's sing a hymn as we close. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. We'll stand as we sing this.
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the invitation of the gospel. We give thanks, Lord, that we have accepted that invitation of the gospel. For those here tonight who are believers, Lord, we have entered into that experience, Lord, of even being saved. And Father, we know that there will be a day even when our redemption will be complete. We wait for that day, Lord, even just to enjoy the wonder of your presence, to behold your glory. Father, just help us to not lose sight ever of that eternal hope that we have, Lord, of that blessed day that we have, even in the midst of this broken world, as we're reminded this morning, Lord, that we don't spend our life looking to this world for meaning, but we look to you. But Father, for those who don't know you, and we know there, there are many even here tonight, Lord, whose hearts are heavy for for their children, for their grandchildren, for even their neighbors. Father, we do pray for them. Lord, we pray that you would speak to them. Lord, we pray even for the times even where we have shared of our faith with them. Maybe times where they've given them that little booklet that we've received. Or times even when they've rejected that invitation. Lord, we pray that their hearts would be softened. Father, pray, Lord, that we would be wise, Lord, when we speak as well. That we would not speak unwisely or behave in a way that would, that would even hinder the, even the gospel being received. But Father, use our words. Help us to use our opportunities. And Father, we long to see even the prodigal come home, Lord. The sinner come home. Father, may they know that rest is possible. Rest can be found in Christ. Satisfaction can be found in Christ. Lasting joy can be found in Jesus, not the things of this world. And so, Lord, help us. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.